Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Joey Manson, and I'm the Center Director of Seward Park Audubon Center. And thank you for joining us tonight on this uh, 1st of April, beautiful evening here in the Puget Sound. So thank you for spending the evening with us tonight. Uh, I'm the Center Director of the Seward Park Audubon Center, and our center's mission is to present programs that connect people to nature and grow their understanding of the natural world with the hope that they will take action to protect birds in the places that they need to thrive. I wanna thank you all for joining us for tonight's program. And I would like to give a special thanks to our presenter and moderator for tonight. Uh, and we also wanna thank all the supporters and all the volunteers who make programs like this possible. Tonight, we have a special guest who will moderate the event. Wendy Call is a writer, editor, and translator who lives in Columbia City. She has published two books of nonfiction, a poetry book that she has translated from Spanish titled In the Belly of Night, is coming out later this year. So look for it. I imagine it's going to be at third place books and hopefully we can carry it also. Uh, and in 2015, she created an interactive literary map of Seward Park called Skabuxit Stories. Uh, you can find that at www.sewardparkstories, all one word, sewardparkstories.org. And hopefully Wendy will remind you of that before we, uh, we wrap up tonight. And at this point, I want to turn it over to Wendy Call. Wendy, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Joey. I am really honored to have been invited to be part of, of this event, um, celebrating and learning more about this fabulous book, Wild Isle. And um, I, one of the great things about, um, for me, having lived in Columbia City uh, since 2005 is that uh, I've been walking distance to this incredible treasure that we have of Seward Park um, during all of the years that I've lived in this neighborhood. And I think that uh, probably many of you on this call share um, the kind of love and even obsession that I have with Seward Park. And so tonight we have um, a true expert on Seward Park, Paul Talbert, Dr. Paul Talbert, to tell us about um, some of um, what is shared in this book. I think actually the focus will be on, on one particular chapter talking about the history of uh, the Wild Isle. Um, so I am here to introduce um, Paul Talbert and also to encourage you all to ask your questions using the Q&A feature of, um, of this webinar. So down at the bottom where it says Q&A with the little speech bubbles, put your questions into the speech bubble and we will be saving those for after Paul's presentation. Um, and then I will um, be having a Q&A with him and would love to bring all of your questions into that conversation. So now to introduce our, our guest for tonight, our presenter, um, Paul Talbert is a geneticist who studies chromatin structure at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center here in Seattle. And he is also the president of Friends of Seward Park, which is a volunteer stewardship and advocacy group um, for our beloved park. He grew up in several places around the country and he has lived in Seattle um, since 1983 and in Hillman City um, near the park since 1997. He became involved with Seward Park um, when he began visiting the peninsula regularly with his infant daughter back in 1999. Um, he has also lived for five months as a visiting scientist in Kurashiki, Japan. Um, speaking of Japan, he is also the author of, of this book, Cherries, Lanterns, and Gates, Jap Japanese and Japanese American Gifts um, in Seattle's Parks, which features um, Seward Park, of course. And you can see from my copy here, which is full of post-it notes, um, I highly recommend this book. The third edition of this book is actually um, out from the publisher today. So you should be able to get that at, um, at the Seward Park Audubon Center. So he is, um, and the reason we're all here tonight, um, the principal author of Wild Isle in the City, Tales from Seward Park's First 100 Years. Um, this book, which you can see um, is, is quite um, an in-depth work. It's also a beautiful work with, with incredible illustrations and um, historical and contemporary photographs and artwork. Um, this book won the 2019 Virginia Marie Fulkins Award for the Outstanding Historical Publication uh, here in King County. And Paul enjoys writing about biology, natural history, and human history, preferably all at once. 
Um, and now Paul is going to talk about all those things with us. Um, so welcome, Paul. Uh, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Joey, for inviting me. Um, and yeah, so uh, Joey asked me to talk specifically about uh, how uh, Seward Park became a park, uh, which is, um, uh, so our book here was a project uh, that started on the centennial of the park in 2011 and um, took us a while to get it out, but um, uh, it was a project from the Friends of Seward Park and uh, with some help from the Lakewood Seward Park Community Center. Um, and as you can see, I'm not the only uh, person who contributed to this book. There are about a hundred names here um, who contributed a bit of research or a list of organisms or a story or a poem or photos. And uh, I'd like to particularly thank the, all the photographers because um, I'm uh, not so naive as to believe that this book would sell all that well if it didn't have all this beautiful photography in it. So I'm, I'm particularly grateful to the photographers who let us use their pictures. And um, I would also like to particularly thank my co-editor, Karen O'Brien with the Rainier Valley Historical Society. Um, she, um, uh, was, she is trained as an archivist, so she helped us find things, a researcher. She acted as a grant writer, photographer, uh-oh, sorry, this will happen. Um, my mouse is touchy and likes to jump to the next slide. Uh, did the, all the layout and collected all the photos and um, helped, helped do the proofreading, contacted the publisher and uh, she's a dog lover, which speaks to her high moral character and uh, she's a good friend. So, um, so what is this book about? Obviously it's about Seward Park, but there are a lot of aspects to Seward Park, uh, including geology, biology, history, uh, ethnic studies. There's even some etymology in this book. Uh, stories, poems, photos, uh, art. Uh, and we talk about music, sports and festivals, etc. And as I mentioned, um, if any of you were at the book launch uh, a bit over a year ago at the Royal Room, uh, in that talk, I talked primarily about chapters one and four about the uh, nature. And uh, this time we're going to talk basically about how the park became a park, which is chapter two here. And um, uh, I should mention, because um, she was a member of our neighborhood, uh, Margaret Bergman actually is the reason I started to research the history of the park. Um, she and I, when my daughter was an infant, would uh, take walks in Seward Park. And Margaret was the news editor for 17 years of the um, Washington Native Plant Society. She was very interested in ethnobotany and would write little articles for their newsletter every month. And she was, uh, she's the person who basically introduced me to uh, what, what's wonderful in Seward Park. And she was a, a role model and a friend. And we used to uh, meet and walk. Not, we didn't do this too many times, but uh, one day when we were walking in the park and we sat down to rest, um, she handed me the sheet of paper uh, of uh, interesting facts about Seward Park. And among those interesting facts was this uh, claim that poison oak saved the park from being logged. I thought, oh, well, that's pretty cool. But um, as I walked around the park, I realized this interesting fact isn't really a fact because the poison oak grows not in the forest, but on the edge of the forest. And of course, poison oak is the most common shrub in California and it didn't stop California from being logged. So this story did not seem right to me. And so I thought, well, what did keep it from being logged? And that is how I started looking into the history of the park because I figured, well, we had to know who owned it before it was a park and uh, how it became a park. And, um, that is, uh, that 20 years ago is what uh, ended up in being a book. So um, we'll come back to uh, why it wasn't logged, but another one of the interesting facts on Margaret's sheet was that the Bailey Peninsula was a seasonal island. 
And um, that one turns out to be true. And uh, the reason that we know that is that uh, Harold Smith, who used to live down where um, Martha Washington Park is now at, um, at the end of the 19th century, uh, described in a letter how he could row across the isthmus when the water was high. And so, um, so that one's true. And uh, this, this photo taken by George Bross in the 1890s was kind of a famous one where it looks like uh, this is Seward Park here. This is actually Mercer Island behind it, but this is Seward Park. And it looks like you could just sail right through here. But of course, most of the time there's an isthmus in the way. Okay, let's just... Um, so uh, when was the water high? Why was the water high? So before the Lake Washington Ship Canal was built, um, the lake drained out uh, from in Renton through the Black River and the Black River joined the Cedar River and then it went down here and joined uh, what was then the White but is now the Green River. That's another story and became the Duwamish River which goes out to Elliott Bay. And so when uh, there was a lot of runoff on the Cedar River, the uh, water would um, back up and it would actually, instead of the water flowing out of the lake, water would flow into the lake. And so the, the Duwamish, whose main villages were here on the Black River, um, referred to this in the Chinook jar jargon as uh, Push or the river with two mouths. And uh, so the, sorry. It'll keep happening. The <clears throat> like it just did. <laughs> uh, the people who lived along the Black River here, I'll mispronounce this, but they were called the Duduapsh, which we anglicized to Duwamish, and their main villages were along the Black River. And that name means people of the inside because they weren't on the sound and they weren't on the lake. They were inside along the river, and um, their name got generalized to. Um, a broader area than just the Black River. And um, the present Duwamish tribe uh, includes descendants of what were called the lake people, the Hachuaps, so the people who lived on the lake. And this is a old photo of Cheshiahood, who uh, you may have heard of if you um, pay attention to Seattle history. And uh, uh, this is actually on Lake Union, but he grew up, um, uh, on the Cedar River and, and later lived at Bryn Mawr before he lived on Portage Bay. And we'll come back to him in a bit. But right now, um, let's talk about his daughter, Jenny Davis, and her husband, Jack Davis, uh, were uh, uh, consultants or resources for uh, the anthropologist T.T. Waterman, who went around in 1916 and collected uh, the native names for locations in and around Seattle. And he recorded two names for um, the Seward Park Peninsula. The, the name um, Skabuxid refers to the peninsula as a whole or specifically to the tip of the peninsula um, because it means nose or noses. And um, the other name was Skalipsid for the upper, which means upper part of the neck for the isthmus. So those names make a fair amount of sense. And um, I don't know for sure if, uh, Jenny Davis is the one who gave him those names, but um, something she did do was record the names of the villages around the lake. Um, this was for a 1927 court case, Duwamish et al. versus the United States, where the various tribes who felt like their treaty rights were being ignored and um, uh, were kind of upset that uh, they didn't have any real compensation for the land that was taken. Um, so she submitted this list of uh, names of the villages around the lake as a, you know, a sort of quantifiable um, thing of value, all these uh, houses and villages that they had around the lake, uh, for which um, I believe they were given some pittance of compensation. And of course, the names were not written down by her. They were written down by a, a court clerk who did not speak with shoot seed. And so, um, if you try to match these names up with the names that T.T. Waterman recorded, they, for the most part, they don't match that well. And so it's a little hard to know where these were because uh, they didn't come with a map. 
this map was traced by me. Um, but uh, the historian David uh, Berge, whose uh, most recent book is called Chief Seattle, he identified most of these village names with names that Waterman had recorded. And so we can figure out where they were. There were some which he couldn't figure out. Um, one of them is number two there, Sakal Ulsh. Uh, and um, from the order of the villages around the lake, it, it looks like she listed them pretty much in order from the south end of the lake up to the north and around. And um, so you can presume that Sakal Ulsh was somewhere in the south end of the lake. And the um, question I had was, was there a village at Seward Park? And um, I got the answer from James Rasmussen, who's a tribal elder. And he said, no, they would never put a village where there wasn't a stream or a river. So um, if you look at where streams and rivers are in the south end of the lake, there's um, Taylor Creek at Dead Horse Canyon down there between one and three, or there used to be uh, Genesee Creek came down Rainier Valley and uh, went out to Wetmore Slough, which is where Genesee Park is now. And so those are two possible locations. Um, but uh, Waterman actually recorded names for both of those places and they are not Sakal Ulsh. So we don't know if one of these places had an additional name or if Sakal Ulsh referred to somewhere else. And there's a couple of the other um, villages that uh, we're not certain where they were either. But um, Jenny, we would know basically nothing if Jenny Davis hadn't uh, supplied this list. So uh, what was at, uh, on, in Seward Park at that time if there uh, wasn't a village? Well, of course, there was the, the old growth magnificent forest that's still there, uh, which has trees up to 500 years old. Um, the forest is uh, dominantly made up of Douglas fir, but there's a lot of red cedar and hemlock and madrona and alder, organ ash and big leaf maple. And of course, um, we also had Andrews Bay, which has a lot of useful resources. Uh, you know, it's because it's kind of a unique area in the lake that's uh, both shallower than most of the lake and somewhat sheltered. It's a good place for juvenile salmon to grow and uh, pea mouse and sockeyes both spawn in the bay. Um, you can see kingfishers, ospreys, eagles, and great blue herons all fish there, which tells you that there are fish. And of course, in the winter, we get a lot of kinds of ducks, um, which um, the native people would hunt. And we have pie-billed greaves and red-winged blackbirds that nest among the cattails and burr reeds and tulees. And cattails were quite a valuable resource for the, uh, the Hachuaps. And of course, there were uh, muskrats and beavers and other things that um, lived there. So, um, so although the lake people didn't live there, they, they undoubtedly took uh, resources from there. Um, uh, several kinds of fish, uh, in, especially in the fall for the salmon runs or, or late summer. Um, in the winter when fish weren't as common, they could hunt deer and elk and uh, beaver and grouse and um, ducks. And you know, in the summer, there were about 10 kinds of different berries that they could gather. Uh, and in the spring, there were fern fiddleheads, fiddleheads that could be eaten and camas uh, and lily bulbs and onions. And in the fall, they could gather um, acorns or hazelnuts. And then they also could use uh, various kinds of wood. Of course, they made their longhouses out of cedar. They would use alder and oak and other woods to make uh, utensils or you know the poles that you see here for fish drying racks. They used willows to make fishing weirs. And of course the cattail mats you can see in the photo, um, those were, cattails were very important. They used these mats for almost everything. They slept on them. They made temporary shelters uh, by throwing them over a frame. And then uh, nettle, they could make string from nettle and uh, they could use bone to, for needles or other tools and they could decorate baskets with bitter cherry bark. So there are a lot of things in the park that they probably made use of in what's now the park. And of course, the, the, the Duwamish or Duwamish tribe is still with us and um, they did, although, you know, their population was 
wiped out by 90% by smallpox and measles and cholera and other stuff. They have survived and are still around and um, have been led for uh, some time by uh, trial chairman Cecile Hansen, who's um, sort of kept the effort to try to get federal recognition for them, which they received under the last days of the Clinton administration, but then it was revoked under the Bush administration. And um, that's uh, still the status at the moment. Um, for the Centennial, we invited their youth dancing group to come perform. We asked them if they would. And uh, they showed up in a canoe, which is why they look half clothed here. Um, and they danced for us and it was very nice. And uh, these, uh, these youth are, since that was a decade ago, these uh, youth are now um, young adults with jobs and families and whatnot. And I don't think um, uh, Singing Feet or Twibship, the dance group exists anymore, but um, it was a, a great thing to have in our community when it did. So of course, uh, all that changed pretty dramatically with the arrival of the Euro-American settlers. And um, uh, David Denny arrived at, at Alki in September of 1851 and uh, was sort of dropped off there and um, sent uh, word south to uh, I think Portland is where his brother and um, the other members of the party were hanging out. And he said, hey, this is great. Come on up here. Um, and uh, the Denny party arrived two months later. And um, uh, when they got out and it was raining in November, the winter month of the year, uh, reportedly the women started crying about what are we doing here? <clears throat> um, and so they stayed there over the winter, uh, but in the spring, uh, most of them moved over to what's now Pioneer Square, uh, which, cause it was less exposed than, than Alki. And so um, David Denny was one of the very few settlers who learned to speak Lachute Seed. Um, many of them learned the Chinook jargon, which was kind of a, a trade language, but um, uh, David Denny actually learned Lachute Seed. And this is a picture of him drawn by his daughter, Emily Inez Denny, of him shaking hands with Chief Seattle. So right about the time, actually just before the Denny party was moving from Alki to Pioneer Square, um, there were two other uh, people who arrived. Uh, John Harvey and Edward Clark uh, came up on a ship from San Francisco. And uh, John Harvey was an Englishman who as a boy had, <clears throat> excuse me, dreamed of coming to America and having a farm. And uh, uh, he managed to, sign up on the crew of a ship bound for San Francisco. And as the ship was leaving San Francisco Harbor, he, he literally jumped ship and swam to shore under penalty of death for desertion and uh, made his way to the gold rush. And there he met um, Edward Clark who had come from Pennsylvania and left behind a, a daughter and a son and um, they made some money in the gold rush, um, apparently, uh, but then they decided to move up and check out Puget Sound. And so they uh, disembarked in Seattle. Um, initially, they worked to help clear logs. Um, and then they made their way over Beacon Hill to, um, to the Seward Park neighborhood, to shores of Lake Washington, and they each Take their claim under the Oregon Donation Land Claim Act, each adult could claim 160 acres um, as long as they lived on it for four years. And um, um, so they had a common cabin um, because uh, 160 acres is actually quite a lot of area. And um, if they put their cabin on the boundary of their claims, they could not be all alone in the middle of the wilderness. Um, but still be technically living on their claims. So um, the boundaries shown here for the claims are a bit of a guess because their claims uh, were before this 1861 survey map was made. And um, if you look up their claims, it just talks about, well, there's you know uh, a cottonwood and from there, uh, we go this many you know, yards to the shore and then we go along the shore. 
and then back this many yards. And so it's a little hard to figure out exactly where those were, but um, this is the general area. Um, so uh, Harvey, as I mentioned, wanted to be a, become a farmer. So uh, like a lot of um, uh, pioneers, he, he also worked in the logging industry, but his aim was to set up a farm. And so why did they pick this area, which was not where um, other people were settling at Pioneer Square? Uh, most likely because it had already been cleared by the, uh, the Hachuaps, the lake people. Um, we can guess that because we know that at the time of the survey in 1861, there were oaks present from uh, Seward Park down to Pritchard's Island, and that oaks are um, a, a fire tolerant species that usually grows in what we call oak prairies. And uh, the oaks may actually have been planted by the lake people, but um, they're a pretty good indicator that the area had probably been cleared by burning by the lake people beforehand. And so of course it's much easier to have a farm if at least a good portion of the land is already cleared for you. So um, that happened actually a lot all over. The, the native people would be away fishing or whatever and um, the Euro-American settlers would just come in and said, hey, nobody's living here. So let's just take this spot. So, um, that area became uh, known as Clark's Prairie, uh, presumably because Clark lived there. And um, shortly after uh, Harvey and Clark arrived, uh, settlers down in Renton um, uh, decided to build a sawmill along the Black River. Uh, and so before they did that, um, uh, two settlers, Eaton and Fanjoy, circumnavigated the lake to make sure that the water wasn't going to run out somewhere else. And when it didn't, they um, helped uh, uh, Samuel Tobin uh, build a dam across the Black River here below the confluence, oops, sorry, below the confluence of the Cedar. And they raised the lake up six feet. So most people who live in Seattle know that the lake was lowered in 1916 by about nine feet when the Mont Lake Cut was put through. But um, and very few people uh, that I've run into are aware that the lake was actually raised in 1853 by six feet. And during that time, um, the Seward Park Peninsula was almost certainly an island, uh, both because of the water was six feet higher and because when you look at Harvey and Clark's claims and they talk about a line along the lake shore, they don't mention anything about uh, having to go around a big 200 acre peninsula, which would be bigger than their entire claim. So um, the, the conclusion that I draw from that is that it was actually an offshore island and um, they, they didn't actually include that as part of their claims. So uh, Edward Clark was kind of a hothead. Um, there was a somewhat fictionalized biography of him written by um, Cornelius Hanford, who was one of his students when Clark was a school teacher who said that Clark was usually a good teacher and kind, but uh, sometimes he would um, uh, basically beat the children with uh, hickory uh, rods. So um, um, he was kind of a hothead and um, further attestation of that comes from the fact that he was involved in a lynch mob. So in 1854, David Denny, if you, who you remember, could understand Lachute Seed, uh, heard some of the natives talking about a murder that had happened. And it had actually happened the year before and um, the body had been buried uh, right near um, Fred Hutchins Cancer Research Center where I work. And um, uh, so they came and they found that and they presumed that it was this guy, James McCormick, that um, his family had sent word that he was had gone missing. Um, although at this point, I'm not sure that they could identify the body, but uh, they quickly rounded up four Indians that they suspected were, uh, had murdered this guy. And um, one of them, an old guy was let go pretty quickly. And Two of them were lynched pretty quickly by uh, Luther Collins and Associates. And uh, uh, a young, younger Indian named Peace Sumkin uh, 
was about to be lynched when um, uh, Sheriff Carson Boren uh, came and stopped the lynch mob, which was led by Clark, and uh, uh, instead sent uh, P. Sumpkin off to Steelacum to be held there for trial, which he was eventually acquitted. And after this um, traumatizing experiment, uh, experience, he uh, changed his name to Cheshiahood, which was a, a name of a relative of his. And um, he was uh, a long time a, a resident of Seattle, even after most other Indians had been driven out of Seattle, he, he stayed, he was good friends with David Denny and um, he was, uh, there are a number of stories about the Battle of Seattle about who warned the settlers, um, uh, but one of, and they don't, they're somewhat contradictory, but uh, the one from Emily Inez Denny, who was actually in the Battle of Seattle, although she was an infant at the time, um, she says that there was a, a chain of people uh, who passed word to the settlers that there was an attack coming, uh, which included Cheshiahud, and Cheshiahud spent the battle um, in the village of Seattle, um, you know, hiding out there uh, as opposed to being on the other side. Um, so I mentioned earlier that he was uh, thought to have uh, originally lived on the Cedar River where his daughter Jenny Davis grew up and uh, went around the lake with her grandfather and that he later lived at Bryn Mawr. And in the around 1880, David Denny um, uh, either sold or gave him some land. There's uh, independent traditions about this. Um, uh, and uh, on Portage Bay. And if you go to the end of Shelby Street on Portage Bay, there's a little plaque to him. And that uh, area right around there, the uh, the plat is called John's Edition, and it's named after him. He was known as uh, Lake Union John to people who didn't want to try to pronounce Ch uh, Cheshire. Um, so um, he, uh, this photo is actually of his second wife. Uh, his first wife, uh, Spiels Dot, was uh, the mother of Jenny Davis, and. Um, she died uh, not too long after he moved to Lake Union and he remarried. And um, his second wife, Klebelitz, uh, uh, lived there with him for uh, quite a while. He lived to be probably about 90 years old. So the Battle of Seattle, uh, it was a one day battle. Um, uh, there are conflicting stories, <laughs> but the usual consensus is that it was actually Yakimas and Klickitats from over the mountains who came and attacked Seattle because they were upset about the treaty violations. And um, uh, uh, this is a, in the upper left is the, a painting from Emily Inez Denny of the settlers running to the blockhouse when they found out that they were under attack. And at the uh, bottom here, you can see my pointer, this is uh, Emily's mother, Louisa Denny, carrying Emily into the blockhouse. So she painted herself in the picture. And off in Puget Sound here, you can see the USS Decatur, which was um, a ship that was actually in the area because they were worried about Indian attacks. And it was armed with cannons and um, that sort of made the difference in, in the battle. So, um, uh, after they fired on the Indians a few times, the, the whole battle ended in, in less than 24 hours. There were uh, two fatalities among the Euro-American settlers, and uh, we basically have no idea um, how many Indians were killed, if any. So um, these two drawings are from Thomas Phelps, who was the lieutenant on the Decatur, and they basically show uh, the this is sort of a, a waterline view, the, the, the blockhouse, and um, here's Yesler's Wharf where the sawmill, his sawmill was, and uh, the various houses down here on this little spit of land, which was now the area south of, um, of uh, Pioneer Square, uh, which is up here by where the, the logging mill wharf is. And of course, this area was all filled in subsequently. So um, although uh, 
the um, the settlers survived the um, outside the village of Seattle. Uh, almost every building in King County was burnt to the ground, in, including the dam. So the the dam didn't last past 1856. So um, since Harvey's and Clark's buildings were burned, um, uh, Harvey filed for uh, compensation for the government as, as well as other people uh, for the damage he had suffered, but um, he never actually received any compensation. And um, in 1858, uh, Clark so both of them went and stayed elsewhere for a while after the battle uh, for safety. They, uh, they spent like 10 months um, either in this the village of Seattle or, or on patrol um, uh, as part of the, the army detail. Um, but in 1858, Clark sold his claim to David Graham and um, Harvey did the same thing a couple weeks later and Harvey uh, left the area and went on and um, became a founding settler in Snohomish and his descendants there uh, run the Harvey Airfield. Um, so um, since David uh, owned this land while when the 1861 survey happened, um, they sort of adjusted the boundaries of the land to fit the survey lines. And so um, that's, this is what David owned and he owned the isthmus, but not the bulk of the peninsula. And another thing you see on this map is the name Andrews Bay, which first appears in the 1861 survey. And that's what we still call that bay. And Andrews Peninsula, which is not what we still call that peninsula, but um, that was the name given in the survey in 1861. And um, Apparently, it was named after Lyman B. Andrews, who was on the survey crew. And um, there's no particular explanation for why his name is attached to it, but it's the best explanation we have since there were um, basically no other Andrews in the Seattle area at that time. And of course, Lyman Andrews went on to be a, a, a founder at Issaquah um, and uh, to uh, mine coal there, which he uh, found out about from uh, Native American informants. So, um, so unlike uh, Harvey, Clark continued to stay in the area and um, he became Seattle's first photographer. He set up a photography business. He had already earlier built himself a house uh, right down in Pioneer Square, uh, kitty corner from the, the Yesler house at uh, the Southwest corner of First and Yesler Way and uh, which he called his wet cheer house. And it's apparently from that house that he took this very first picture of Seattle, which shows Sarah Yesler standing on her porch and this uh, bizarre water delivery system. And he took another photo the next year where the water delivery system is gone, but otherwise it looks like almost exactly the same photo. And um, those are the only two pictures that we know for sure that he took. But the Seattle Public Library has some photos, such as this one of the Denny family that are dated, like this is dated 1858, and there was no other photographer in Seattle until 1861 at the earliest. And so these photos were probably um, taken by Edward Clark as part of his photo business. As the same with the, the photo I showed before of he himself, that was probably a self-portrait. Um, however, uh, he died in 1860 at the tender age of 32, and uh, we don't know the circumstances. His death was reported in the Olympia newspaper, but um, no details about how he died. So David Graham now had this land, um, uh, and he had come from New York following his older brother, Walter, who had come a couple years earlier. And both of them ended up marrying uh, daughters of Thomas Mercer. Uh, David married Susanna and uh, Walter married Eliza. And Eliza was only 15 at the time she was married. And I sort of shudder to think how old Susanna was, but um, she didn't get married till a few years after Eliza. So maybe she was older, I don't know. Um, but uh, Eliza was in a, um, 
a horse riding accident uh, from which she got an infection and died in 1862. And uh, uh, Walter was living down on the Duwamish at that point, the Duwamish River, but uh, he and David swapped land for whatever reason. And so um, Walter Graham came up in 1863 and lived on uh, this area that used to be David's, which also included this area that's named Mercer here. And he bought this additional little piece here. So altogether he had uh, over 300 acres of land. So uh, that was quite a bit. And he had a farm there. He had planted apple orchard, uh, which is we think is right here. And um, <clears throat> he grew potatoes and he hunted deer and grouse. And uh, he said the salmon were so thick you could scoop them up in barrels and you could find oysters down on the Elliott Bay. And uh, so presumably he lived there for a couple of years with his two small sons before, um, before he found another wife. So, um, and uh, we think we know that he lived right near 57th and Eddy because um, uh, Sophie Fry Bass in her book, When Seattle Was a Village kind of describes the location and that seems to be where it is. And um, I think uh, that was probably where Harvey and Clark lived too, not only because it would have already been cleared, but um, in the 1861 survey, it kind of refers to the general direction of where Harvey's buildings were. So I imagine that Walter just moved in where they had previously lived. So um, we'll get to these people who actually own the peninsula in just a second. Uh, but first we have a little detour about the Mercer girls. So um, Eliza and Susanna's uncle, Acer Mercer, uh, as you may know, in 1864, thought there were not enough women around Seattle because the um, sex ratio was about 10 men to one woman at the time. And so he went back to uh, Lowell, Massachusetts and persuaded um, 11 respectable, marriageable women, not prostitutes to come move out to Seattle and to get married to all the wonderful men who lived there. And um, the very first one of these 11 women to get married was Catherine Kate Stickney, who married Walter Graham uh, two months after she arrived. And they were um, uh, apparently evolved enough, in, involved enough in the community that they were founding members of the Seattle Public Library, which I did not realize went back to the 1860s. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, they sold 100 acres of their land uh, exclusively of the apple orchard to Asa Mercer. And I you kind of want to think that it had something to do with, you know, paying the transport price or something, but, but um, we don't actually know. I mean, Asa Mercer was, you know, a, uh, uncle-in-law of, of Walter, so who knows. Um, and of course, Acer did not spend much, if any, time on that land because he went off right away to go get a second expedition of brides, uh, which uh, unfortunately he ran out of money when they got to San Francisco. And so he had to borrow $1,500 from uh, some passengers who were on the ship with them, uh, John and Zipporah Wilson. And uh, he himself married one of these Mercer girls, uh, Annie Stevens, in 1866. And he gave his land to the Wilsons to repay the debt. So uh, down here at the bottom, you can see this picture of what I believe is their farm, um, uh, the, where that went from the Grahams to the Asa Mercer to the Wilsons. And by the time this photo was taken in 1903, it belonged to uh, Judge Everett Smith, whose son, Harold Smith, you remember, could row across the isthmus. And this is the Bailey Peninsula in the background here. And this is Mercer Island over on the right-hand side. And what looks like a steep cliff or something here is actually a, a watermark that runs across the photo, unfortunately. But um, it's one of the earliest photos of the Bailey Peninsula, so, what, what we now call the Bailey Peninsula. Uh, I guess it was the Andrews Peninsula then. So, um, and of course, the Mercer girls have been the subject of uh, several books and TV shows that some of you may have seen. Um, so Kate Graham, uh, although she was like the first Euro-American woman living in the area, 
Um, she didn't live there very long because she also got sick and died. And uh, Walter went off to New York and uh, got his childhood friend Elizabeth Crommins to come out and be his third wife. So he must have had some kind of charm to have three wives when um, most men at the time had zero. So I guess he was a catch. All right, so when we were looking at the map, I, I mentioned the, the people who actually owned the peninsula as opposed to Isthmus. Uh, so most of the peninsula, <coughs> excuse me, was bought by Philip Ritz in 1868. Uh, who was an absentee landlord. So um, the reason that the peninsula was not logged is because it was owned by absentee landlords of which Philip Ritz was the first. So he had also come out for the gold rush, but then he ended up in Corvallis uh, and had a successful fruit tree nursery. And he had a lot of business out of Walla Walla. So he moved his nursery there in 1862 and he was, evidently successful enough in the nursery business that he could take time and effort to be a strong lobbyist for bringing the Northern Pacific Railroad to Washington Territory. And um, <clears throat> while he was in uh, Commencement City um, scoping out you know, a potential terminus for the railroad or something, he, uh, he, uh, it's claimed that he suggested that they change their name to Tacoma instead of the kind of dopey name Commencement City. And um, there's a competing story that someone else suggested the name, but um, we'll go with Philip Ritz. And um, he bought uh, <clears throat> a bunch of property, lakefront property, waterfront property in and around Seattle and elsewhere, um, including the bulk of the Andrews Peninsula in 1868. He bought the entire west shore of Mercer Island, Wetmore Slough, Sandpoint, Portage Bay, Denny Blaine Park. And presumably this was all for investment because he continued to live in Walla Walla, Walla um, except when he was on his wheat farm in mm -hmm. Adams County where he had uh, got 5,500 acres, which seems like a whole lot uh, from uh, bought from the railroad if you, you know, the railroads were given all this land um, and where he grew wheat. And uh, one of his friends jokingly referred to his little house there is Ritzville, and that subsequently became uh, the name of a post office that went in. And then when a bunch of German immigrants came and made a town there, it was the name of the town. So uh, Ritzville is named after Philip Ritz. And if you go to Ritzville, you can see this lovely um, iron statue of him. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but he's standing on a, um, a railroad rail on a track. and. He's holding a sign for his uh, nursery and holding a bunch of wheat. So um, that's kind of who he was. And he left the Bailey Peninsula alone, the Andrews Peninsula alone. So uh, you might have noticed on the map at the very tip, there was another name that was John Maggs um, who bought that Northern tip, which was a separate lot at about the same time that uh, Ritz bought the main part of the peninsula. And uh, Ritz had been a lighthouse keeper at Nia Bay, and then he worked the trading post at Nia Bay for uh, Henry Webster, who lived in Port Townsend. And um, at a certain point, he was uh, tired of that job and he went home back east to, I think, Pennsylvania and got trained in dentistry, and then came out and had a dentist's office uh, in downtown Seattle, downtown Seattle. And he had a farm on Lake Union. Um, but after a few years, um, apparently he didn't like dentistry as much as being a lighthouse keeper. So he went and became the lighthouse keeper at uh, Point No Point. <coughs> and um, he was apparently very serious about it. Uh, the logs there indicate that um, he had a number of assistants that he thought were um, too incompetent to do this job right. And um, uh, so he was there for a few years, and even though he, when he wasn't the lighthouse keeper anymore, he had bought property adjacent to the lighthouse. And um, so he lived there off and on. Uh, he still had his farm on Lake Union, where at one point he uh, uh, ran the Seattle Dry Dock Company for ships. And he started a water company, which um, still was part of the Seattle water system up into the 1950s from a spring on his property. 
Um, so, but in 1883, he sold uh, the buck sitter, the Andrews Peninsula, to Henry Webster, and also he Webster Point in Laurelhurst, and um, so that that was the end of his part of the story. But if you go out to Point No Point, there's this house there, the Mag's house, which is not actually where he lived. It was built by his wife after he died, but you can apparently uh, rent out this house if you want to go hang out at Point No Point. <clears throat> Me, I need a drink. So in 1884, Seattle's park system started because David Denny donated land for Denny Park. And he had actually previously donated the same bit of land for a cemetery. But um, when they decided they needed a park, he, they um, dug up all the people in the cemetery and moved them up to what's now Lakeview Cemetery next to Volunteer Park. And uh, they turned Denny Park into a park, which is currently the <clears throat> where Parks Department headquarters is. So, so in 1889, um, a lot of things changed. So uh, Philip Ritz died, and his widow sold the peninsula to um, William Bailey, and. Um, <clears throat> Webster had actually already been dead, and his widow uh, sold his bit of the peninsula to William Bailey. And William Bailey also bought uh, a couple of little lots here. <clears throat> this part of the Graham property had been divided up. Um, there was one piece that was owned by William Green, uh, but William Bailey now owned most of the peninsula, which is why we now call it the Bailey Peninsula. And um, uh, the Grahams had eventually sold uh, the rest of their property to, whoops, sorry, to uh, Joshua and Sarah Sears, um, who lived out in Boston. And as far as we know, there's um, no evidence that they ever even came to Seattle, let alone sell their property. But they were uh, financial backers of Peter Kirk, the founder of Kirkland. And Peter Kirk wanted to turn um, Kirkland into a, a steel town. and uh, the, the Sears owned a lot of property in Kirkland, and it may be that they bought this piece of real estate over on this side of the lake uh, so that they could, you know, ship steel or whatever from Kirkland over to Seattle. Uh, I'm not sure that's speculation, but uh, Sarah Sears was, um, uh, of course, uh, Joshua Sears was the wealthiest man in Boston, so she was... Um, uh, independently wealthy herself. And uh, she was a noted photographer and an art collector of uh, considered progressive tastes in art and was quite uh, well respected in those areas back in Boston and <clears throat> uh, was connected enough to uh, get painted by John Singer Sargent. So quite a nice painting in my opinion. So while Bailey was, uh, he became parks commissioner. Um, oh, let's back up. Uh, so because he came from this wealthy steel family, um, he'd come out in 1888 to visit after he finished college and then decided he would come live here in 1889, uh, just before the Great Seattle Fire. And after the Great Seattle Fire, um, he had money to dump into rebuilding downtown where he built uh, <coughs> the, sorry, the Rainier Hill Hotel and the Bailey Building, which is still standing, um, but it's now known as the Broderick Building, but um, you can go down and see that at Second and Cherry. He also bought up uh, two newspapers, the Seattle Press and the Times, and combined them into the Press Times, and he sponsored the press expedition uh, uh, across the Olympic Mountains, it was the first uh, Euro-American expedition across the Olympics. And um, uh, for whatever reason, um, most likely because he was, uh, you know, um, a big investor in the downtown, they, they made him parks commissioner. And so he was parks commissioner at the time when uh, the second, uh, <clears throat> or sorry, park, he was on the parks board. I'm not sure they called him. Anyway, the park superintendent was Edward O. Schragerl, uh, and he proposed that they should acquire the Bailey Peninsula for a park back in 
1892. Um, she has this great quote, which I love. Parks are full of nature's innocent and holy inspirations, and in them are whispers of peace and joy. Parks are the breathing lungs and beating hearts of great cities. So Schwagerl had already, uh, he was kind of a disciple of uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, and he had already designed parks in Tacoma, Wright Park and uh, Point Defiance Park and uh, Kinnear Park in Seattle. Um, and he had a plan to make major parks in the four quarters around Seattle at Bailey Peninsula and Alki and Sand Point and uh, where Discovery Park is now, West Point, and, um, uh, uh, and connect them with boulevards. So uh, he had this grand plan, um, but unfortunately um, in, in uh, 1893 was the Panic of 1893, which was a big economic recession. And so uh, Schwagerl uh, shelved his park plans and lost his job and went to work for the University of Puget Sound. Um, and William Bailey uh, went back to Pennsylvania um, and he sold the Press Times to Alden Bluffin, which became the Seattle Times that we still have. And um, Sears had built a bank in Kirkland to, uh, as part of their backing of Kirkland, but the, the bank never opened and Kirkland never became a steel town. And um, uh, part of the reason Bailey might have bought the peninsula is because the Rainer Avner Electric Railway had gone through and you know Columbia City was growing, uh, but the railway went bankrupt. So um, a lot of bad things from the Panic of 1893. However, just a few years later, uh, we had the gold rush and uh, the most lasting legacy of Bailey was that he had hired Erastus Brainerd from Philadelphia to come out and run the Press Times. And uh, after uh, <clears throat> Bailey sold the Press Times, uh, Brainerd got a job as a, kind of a publicity agent for the city uh, to get a gold, the gold assay office right here in Seattle. And um, he lobbied all over. He sent out uh, traveling tours with nuggets of gold and uh, wrote to all the congressmen and um, encouraged people to, you know, encourage their relatives to all come and go to uh, the Klondike to get gold and to come through Seattle and spend your money buying equipment there. And so that was uh, referred to as mining the miners and it worked. They would publish maps that only showed routes through Seattle. They didn't show like San Francisco or LA and uh, people did it. They came to Seattle and they went on up to the Klondike gold rush and they you know, bought all their equipment in Seattle. And if they made any gold, uh, they got the, uh, they came down to Seattle to the gold assay office to have it evaluated. And Seattle grew rich off the gold rush. And uh, it was in a significant part due to Erastus Brainerd. So, um, uh, whoops, sorry. I'm trying to get, I've got uh, a bar showing here, which I'm trying to get rid of. Oh, oh, sorry, am I muted? I'll assume I am not muted. Okay. Um, <clears throat> All right, so uh, the city was uh, now wealthy and so they hired the Olmsted brothers to come out and design a park system for them. And um, so in May of 1903, uh, John C. Olmsted here in the middle and Percy Jones, his assistant behind him, um, met with the park board, who are these other people, 
And they went around and visited different potential areas for parks, including they had a picnic on the Bailey Peninsula and uh, uh, Olmstead produced a park and boulevard plan uh, that uh, incorporated the parks that already existed, as well as um, making boulevards out of bike paths. And um, uh, so this is an interesting photo because it looks like uh, John Olmstead is smoking a pipe here. But if you look more closely, you realize his hand is actually down here on his coat. And um, this is the hand of Percy Jones, who is probably holding the, the um, shutter for the photo. It's, he's taking the photo. And uh, this, what looks like a pipe is I think just a shadow under his neck plus the, the shutter. Anyway, um, so uh, the number one thing that, uh, uh, Olmsted recommended as the high priority would be to acquire the Bailey Peninsula because he called it the most available large tract of land that is uniformly and beautifully covered with woods and should be secured before the woods are injured. And as you can see, development was uh, happening apace just off the peninsula. Um, this, sorry, this uh, house over here on the left is still present on Orcas Street. So this was. Uh, taken uh, by Percy Jones in 1903. Of course, as soon as there was a park plan, everybody wants to live by a park. And so that uh, uh, fostered real estate speculation. And um, if you remember this uh, little lot here that Bailey did not own, um, was owned by William Green, but he sold it to uh, Martin Burkhart, who with his partner, Irwin, um, turned it into the, uh, Winhart Village lots, and uh, <clears throat> he sold like 12 of them to have a waterfront property, right? So it was actually up on the hill above the play studio, but uh, so I'm not quite sure how the waterfront property part worked. It, it worked if you were willing to climb down the hill, I guess. But, um, and as a deal with the city to get them to put a road, they, uh, he yielded the, he deeded the right of way along the lakeshore here uh, for a road to the city and gave them rights to, sorry, mine the sandstone there uh, <clears throat> in exchange for making the Bailey Peninsula Boulevard. So um, the city apparently did that, but the Bailey Peninsula Boulevard never connected to anything else because the city did not own this other land. And so uh, they're like, well, you never filed a plat. We're not under any obligation to connect this road up. So, um, So uh, uh, the Winhart Villa was one kind of real estate speculation. Um, an entirely different kind uh, was uh, taken on by C.D. Hillman, um, uh, who uh, Hillman City, where I live, was named after. And C.D. Hillman was the largest landowner in the Pacific Northwest and um, was entirely self-made regs to riches guy. And the way he got his riches were um, by doing lots of things like um, selling lots in the middle of Green Lake to people or selling people lots that, selling lots, uh, the same lot to more than one person or to sell lots that uh, when on the ground weren't the same size they were on the plat. And um, he even um, erected an entirely fake city up by uh, Camino Island, a, a kayak point. And, had people come up on a ship and hired actors to um, to man the fake stores and uh, to show all the lovely produce that had been grown there that he had actually bought at Pike Place Market a few hours before. And um, uh, after that particular incident, he was uh, convicted of mail fraud because he had advertised in the mail. Um, they had a hard time convicting him locally because he was, you know, rich and powerful and best friends with. Uh, Alden Blethen, the you know, editor of the Times, who uh, undoubtedly gave him good press. Um, but uh, the federal people were not so um, uh, easily persuaded and they convicted him of mail fraud, which he fought all the way up to the Supreme Court um, who uh, declined to take his case. Um, uh, and, um, but he only spent, he was convicted for two and a half years, uh, sentenced to two and a half years, but he only spent like eight of it in jail before uh, President Howard Taft uh, pardoned him. And um, it's not clear why uh, 
uh, President Taft would be involved in pardoning a real estate swindler, but um, the fact that uh, C.D. Hillman was a wealthy Republican donor uh, could possibly have had something to do with it. So, um, the biggest legacy of Hillman <clears throat> is undoubtedly the fact that his uh, modus operandi was to buy land, clear it off, and plant uh, Luther Burbank's Himalayan giant blackberry all over it because it grew quickly and he could advertise that the land was great for berry farms and, and people would buy it. And so um, as you look out across the Pacific Northwest, uh, Hillman owned land not only in Washington, but also in <coughs> Oregon and California. Um, wherever you see uh, Himalayan blackberries, you should think of C.D. Hillman because he probably had a significant role in getting that blackberry there. So. <coughs> so when the uh, Bailey Peninsula was proposed for a park, both by uh, Schwagerl and Olmsted, it wasn't actually part of Seattle, uh, but in 1907, um, Seattle annexed uh, Columbia City and Southeast Seattle, which included Hillman City and the Bailey Peninsula, Ballard, Ravenna, South Park, and West Seattle. So the size of the city nearly doubled in one year. And so Olmsted uh, put out a supplemental plan in 1908. And again, he recommended acquiring uh, Bailey Peninsula as like the most important part of it. But uh, the city was still uh, working on buying, um, for example, Ravenna Park until uh, Councilman Eugene Way um, refused and promised to block the uh, buying Ravenna Park until they got a park in somewhere in South Seattle. He complained that in South Seattle, we had a red light district and a rat incinerator and a pestilence house, but no parks. So they worked out a deal and um, proceeded to uh, buy Bailey Peninsula and Ravenna Park. So, uh, now the Bailey Peninsula had passed from William uh, Bailey to his father, Charles, and then to his brother, Edward. And Edward um, initially refused to sell the uh, peninsula, although uh, William had known they wanted it for a park, you know, when he was a parks commissioner. Um, but uh, he finally agreed because uh, he knew that there was the possibility of uh, condemning the land by eminent domain and taking it. Um, so he finally agreed to sell it, but he wanted twice what the city wanted to pay. And so they did in fact go to court and um, have condemnation proceedings against all the owners of the peninsula, which included the Baileys, the Sears, uh, Joshua had died by then, but uh, uh, Sarah and her kids were still around. Uh, the owners then bought land in the Winhart Villa. And there were also a number of lien holders. I don't know if you can read all this, but um, you know, here's the Baileys. Here's Sears, these are Winhart Villa owners. And then there's all these Japanese names and which was quite a surprise when I discovered this. It's like, who were these Japanese lien holders? Um, so we'll get to them in just a second. But um, the upshot of this was that uh, Judge Cornelius Hanford, um, who you remember was a student of Clark's and had actually owned um, a piece of the peninsula at one point before it went to William Green. Um, settled on a price intermediate between what the city wanted and what the Baileys wanted of $1,500 an acre, and the total price paid was $323,000, which is actually about what the new Tory cost. So that's what 100 years will bring you. Um, so, who were these lien holders, uh, these Japanese lien holders? Well, it turned out that Joshua Sears had hired uh, one of the lien holders, Payson Richardson, to clear his property on Clark's Prairie. Um, and uh, Payson had agreed to do it in a year if he could have eight acres of it, uh, which we, I believe to have been where the Grams were living, the, uh, the apple orchard for his own once he was done. And so he went to work, but it took him quite a bit more than a year. And he hired a whole bunch of Japanese workers and um, a guy named Henry Henry, who turns out to be Chinese. Um, so we can guess that the name Henry Henry was an anglicized version of some Chinese name. And Henry Henry uh, actually lived right at, uh, on Juno Street or near Juno and 51st. Um, 
but the the Japanese workers lived in tents temporarily and had um, had homes in, down in the international district in the hotels. Um, and so they didn't receive any compensation from uh, when the peninsula was bought because they didn't actually own any land, but they had liens against the Sears estate. Uh, but since it took Richardson uh, more than a year to clean the land, clear the land, once it was cleared, he went to claim his eight acres and uh, the lawyers for the Sears estate said, uh-uh, you didn't do this in a year. And he said, well, wait a minute, you guys knew I was doing this and you never stopped me. And so he took his case to uh, all the way to the Washington Supreme Court who sided with him and they had to give Richardson the land. So, um, so those were the lien holders. And uh, <laughs> in the Rainier Valley Historical Society oral records, uh, the children of Luke Byrne, who came there in about 1903, um, uh, had recollections of their father talking about the Chinese workers on what they called Chink Hill, you know, that they would, as a great sport, they would go up and shoot guns through the roof of the, uh, the tin roof of, of Henry Henry, I assume, and uh, chase the, uh, you know, harass the, <clears throat> what they called the Chinese workers who were probably the Japanese workers. And, um, that was apparently uh, great fun. And the uh, hill was known for as Chink Hill for uh, up until the 30s, at least. Um, so, all right, so uh, once the park was condemned, then um, the park board on June 2nd, 1911, decided to name it for William Seward. So, um, uh, and, um, they, in this little article, it says that it is probable that the statue of William H. Seward, who was Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln and responsible for the purchase of Alaska, uh, where this, his statue now stands in Volunteer Park and it'll probably be moved to Seward Park uh, now that we have a Seward Park, um, which of course it did not happen in the subsequent 110 years. It's still up in Volunteer Park because who wants to move um, a huge statue that um, I have no idea how many tons that would weigh. So uh, the region that the Seward statue is not in Seward Park is because the Seward statue was put in Volunteer Park before Seward Park existed. And the Seward statue originally was built as a gift from the state of New York for the 1909 Alaska Yukon exposition for the New York exhibit, uh, that exhibition. And then the next year they they placed it in Volunteer Park. Um, and then the following year, we got a Seward Park. So there it is. Uh, so um, who was William Seward and why is this park named after him? Well, it's quite clear that the park was named after him because he bought Alaska and uh, Seattle got rich off the Alaska Gold Rush. So that's the reason it's named after him. Um, he never came to the park. He did come to Seattle briefly. Um, so William Seward was an abolitionist. He and his wife were actually um, used their home as part of the Underground Railroad. And uh, he was also a defender of immigrants and, um, and of the mentally ill. He sort of pioneered the um, mental illness defense for um, people accused of crimes. Um, <clears throat> uh, he was uh, among the first people to start talking about civil rights. And he uh, ran for president in 1860. And, was expecting to win because he was uh, fairly well connected in the Republican Party, but instead Abraham Lincoln won and um, uh, he campaigned for Lincoln and he became Lincoln's Secretary of State. And during the Civil War, he um, negotiated treaties to end the African slave trade and negotiated uh, with Britain and France to stay out of the war on the side of the Confederacy. And he negotiated uh, in Mexico to keep uh, to get France to leave Mexico. And um, so he was, uh, Lincoln considered him his right-hand man. And when um, Lincoln was assassinated, uh, there was actually an attempt to assassinate Seward the very same night, uh, which he survived. Um, but then uh, under President Johnson, um, he uh, stayed on as Secretary of State, um, but he became, uh, fairly unpopular. The Democrats didn't like him because he was an abolitionist and the radical Republicans didn't like him because he was uh, uh, 
now working under A Andrew Johnson and um, not uh, defending um, the rights of African Americans under Reconstruction the way they thought he should. And so after uh, Johnson's term end, he retired and well, he bought he bought Alaska under um, Johnson's term. So um, he managed to make that deal. And although he was made fun of for, you know, it was called Seward's Folly, um, it narrowly passed the Senate. And um, he believed that that would be his greatest legacy and uh, most historians agree. And um, so after he retired, he decided to go travel and visit Alaska and see what he had bought and went on and traveled around the world. Um, and um, he was also, as Secretary of State, he became an expansionist after the war. He thought that because of uh, the need for um, a port in the Caribbean to attack the South during the Civil War. Uh, he was became an advocate of uh, acquiring key pieces of real estate like uh, the Dutch West Indies, which are now the American Virgin Islands, and Hawaii, which is now part of America, and Alaska, which is now part of America, and um, the Panama Canal, which hadn't been built yet, but is now, Amer uh, well, we gave it back to Panama eventually. So. Um, although most of those things didn't happen while he was alive, he kind of set the agenda for foreign policy for the next 50 years. Uh, and that was all to uh, have trade with uh, Asia and thought the key to dominating trade with Asia was to have these key pieces of real estate. And so when he was up in Alaska visiting, he um, stopped on Tongass Island where uh, Chief Evans threw him a big potlatch. And the uh, story goes, they gave him a fancy hat and a fancy Bentwood box and some furs, and um, uh, they wanted him to set up a trading post on Tongass Island, um, but he was like oblivious and um, uh, did not reciprocate with either gifts or apparently politeness. In fact, uh, after he purchased Alaska, they extended citizenship to the Russians living there, but not to the Native Americans. So. Um, so after that, Chief Evans had this shaming pole carved at him. This is actually a, a replica that was made in the 1930s, but um, this is what they call a shaving pole. The red lips and red nose and red ears uh, indicate stinginess. So if you go up to Saxman Village in Alaska, you can um, see that uh, kind of unique memory of William Seward. And, uh, in 1912, uh, Olmsteads produced their preliminary plan for Seward Park. And you can see that actually most of the improvements that they wanted were up here at the North End because they assumed people would be coming by boat, right? There was a uh, private property you had to cross to come in this way. But of course they did want a road in here and another set of boat docks here. Um, and uh, you can see that general outlines are kind of where the paths are today, except that they wanted the, instead of a path along the lake shore, which they thought should be left for pedestrians, they wanted the road to be, you know, up above the lake shore. And so that didn't happen, but, um, and a lot of the stuff that they designed didn't happen, but um, the Olmsteads actually preserved like 95% of the forest, which also didn't happen. We lost about a third of the forest to subsequent development, and that can be a talk a topic for a different talk. So I'll stop there um, about how the park became a park and um, take any questions. Thank you so much, Paul. And that is just part of one chapter of this of this incredible book. Uh, so. There are many questions. Some folks have asked questions um, that we will get to and they actually span the range of um, what you say your interests are of biology, natural history and human history. We have all of that <laughs> in questions. Uh, but the first question I wanna ask you is just about the book project itself. Um, what was it that inspired you to take on um, sort of a you know, master book about all of the different aspects of this park? Well, you know, it was kind of like one thing led to another. <laughs> so, um, you know, I started out like, why was the park, you know, didn't it get logged? And turned out it was because it was owned by these people who didn't live in Seattle. 
Um, and um, then uh, uh, actually the very first things I, I did were make uh, plantless and birdless. Um, that was even before I uh, started researching the history. And then of course we had other contributors, you know, Al Smith wrote a couple of big long essays in uh, chapter four about the history of the magnificent forest and um, and you know just as you go through and you look through park records and stuff you find all these you know interesting stories about um, you know the the deer feeding station and the elk that were there and um, you know and once you start on this you kind of have to figure out well like well you know, so like, when did they close the lower loop and make it into a pedestrian path like the Olmsteads wanted originally? And uh, when did um, when did the amphitheater get built? And um, all those kinds of things. And then, you know, there's the people who use the park, and um, you know, the uh, a lot of people grew up going to concerts and whatnot in the park, of which there aren't many anymore. But there's still Shakespeare in the park and. And whatnot, and uh, so you know, I kind of wanted to represent um, what the park means to everybody. And um, there was one topic that I declined to um, investigate. <laughs> Al Smith suggested I uh, have a chapter on crime in the park. <laughs> I'm just like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> we don't want to scare people away. We want them to enjoy the park. So, um, so that that was the only topic I intentionally turned down, but. Uh, mm. Of course, there's always more, more to learn about the park. So. Well, I just learned something. Did you say there were elk in the park? Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> they were they were brought in. They weren't uh, they weren't like living here in um, before that. But um, uh, yeah, that if uh, uh, Joey said we might have more of these talks. Uh, I can talk about it then. But they were brought in right after it was made a park. Uh, the, the Elks Club uh, thought it was desirable to acquire elk for some reason and um, put them at, uh, uh, I think some of them went to the Woodland Park Zoo. I can't quite remember. But um, some of them were released in Seward Park and they, uh, they promptly swam over to Mercer Island and started eating people's apple, apple orchards. <laughs> So they had to be like recaptured and um, and taken to the zoo, basically. <laughs> so, I think they tried to get some elks around the country to adopt them or something. Some elks club members. Each elks club its own elk. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, you know they have like you know little keychains made out of elk hooves and stuff like that. Wow. <laughs> well, there's another question. Um, uh, from one of our audience members, um, Susan, related to another creature that I know was brought into the park. Um, she asked, I understood Chink Hill was re related to a type of pheasant, which I know is yeah, that's in the, the story that, that, is, that is the story that was uh, around in the 30s. And uh, some of my friends who grew up here, I did not grow up here, um, you know, said that in their youth, uh, that was the story they heard that it was, um, that it was called Chink Hill because of the Chinese pheasants, the uh, ringneck pheasants that were there. And those were brought in actually, you know, from China in the, in the 1890s, originally to Port Townsend, and then they kind of spread out from there. And I believe the wildlife department still releases a bunch of them every year for people to hunt. But, um, but uh, the, the oral histories from Rainier Valley, um, they, they make it pretty clear that, uh, uh, that Luke Burns' sons uh, say that it was called Chink Hill because of the Chinese workers that lived there, not, not because of the pheasants. I think that was a slightly more sanitized version, not, not quite as racist. It's still right. racist, but, <laughs> but not quite as much or something. So interesting, uh, inventing a story to sort of not have to face, um, you know, more negative well, Also, you know, by the 1930s, I'm sure Henry Henry was probably dead or gone and the, the Japanese workers were only there for a short time. So, I mean, people may not have known why it was called mm -hmm. that and just assumed that was why it was called that. Right, right. Well, speaking of, of you know, uncovering history, uh, one of the things that I found really fascinating about the book was that you have, in some cases, quite a bit of information about um, 
you know, people that I think are fairly little known in, in Seattle history. So for example, when you're talking about um, the first white settlers who were there, John Harvey and, and Edward Albert Clark about which you have a lot of information, um, how did you gather that information? It's, you know, not something- Yeah, so that was, books. that was pretty interesting. So when I was first starting to investigate um, this, I went to um, uh, Lorraine McConaughey, I I think she was working for the Seattle Public Library at the time, and she had these talks on local history, on how to, you know, research local history and whatnot. And I went to one of them, and uh, there was a guy talking about our area, Columbia City, and reading off the 1861 survey. And I think it mentioned um, Harvey's uh, house. And I'm not sure if if I already knew about Clark and Harvey. So there's a number of these um, histories that were written by Arthur Denny had a short one, and then uh, Roberta Fry Watt um, had kind of a longer history, Blazing, or no, hers is called Four Wagons West. Emily Inez Denny had a book called Blaze, Blazing the Way, and uh, Sophie Fry Bass had a book called When Seattle Was a Village. And if you look in there, you can find mention of the fact that um, Harvey and Clark lived down on the lake, but not really anything about who they were. Um, actually, Roberta Fry Watt, Watt mentions some of the jobs that Clark had. He was also auditor for a while, and she mentions his photography. And um, so, but you know, putting that all together from these scraps was a bit. And part of it was going and looking up the the original land claims and like where were they and and what does it say? And um, it didn't have a lot of you know personal information, but at least it kind of described where they were and. Um, you know, gave their names and where they were from and, and stuff like that, that, you know, the government would record. Um, so, um, and then because Clark was a photographer, um, it turned out there had been some research on him already um, that it took me a while to find, but like Paul Dorpat had an article about him you know, as, you know, Seattle's first photographer. So that was sort of helpful. And then uh, eventually there's, there's a book called, uh, um, early photographers of the far west or something that, where Peter uh, Palmquist had, um, he's the one who, reading him is how I found out that uh, Cornelius Hanford had actually written a bar biography, a fictionalized biography, but nevertheless a biography about, about Clark. And um, um, well, since it's fictionalized, you're not quite sure what all is true or not, but it kind of figured that like the story about coming from the gold rush and all that is, is probably right. And the main fictionalized part of it was that, you know, after Clark lives in Seattle in this fictionalized biography, then he goes off and fights in the civil war and is a big hero or something, which of course Clark died in 1860. So <laughs> he entirely missed the civil war. But um, so there, there was some other information. And then for Harvey, um, I'm not, can't quite remember how exactly I found out that um, he was related to Harvey Airfield, but uh, I contacted Harvey Airfield. And of course the, <clears throat> the woman who runs that now is actually married into the Harvey family and not a direct descendant. But um, she put me in touch with Donna Harvey who lives up in Snohomish and Donna Harvey is very into her family history. And so um, she was able to uh, give me information about you know, who he was and um, what he did up in Snohomish and the fact that there's a family tradition that he had an Indian wife while he was in Seattle and um, you know little tidbits like that. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of piecing together because like I said in the standard histories they're like barely mentioned but but when you when you pull it all together and um, and you sit down with the maps and you know the survey and you try to figure out where was Harvey's buildings here <laughs> and stuff like that. And you realize that like, oh, that's the same place pretty much where Graham was and where the Wilsons were and all that. And, and Pace and Richardson, uh, it seems like they all kind of lived in the same place. So, so thank goodness for family historians and for, and for claim maps and property um, documentation. So you mentioned when you first started working on this project, when was that? So, um, like I said, it kind of started uh, basically 20 years ago and mm -hmm. when, when my daughter was uh, was three months old and I was uh, going down to uh, 
um, visit the park with Margaret Bergman. And, um, it didn't really start quite then, but you know that's when the question arose. And then over mm -hmm. the next few years, I started doing research. And then once the centennial happened in uh, 2011, um, then instead of just being collecting information and you know having some stories, it uh, sort of became committed to the idea of producing a book. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it became a bit of a community project. So. Yeah, we collected stories from the community and, um, you know, Al Smith wrote a couple of lengthy essays and um, a few other people contributed essays. And um, so I wrote about 70% of the text, but um, it's not all my words. And, um, mm -hmm. and then originally Karen O'Brien was like, well, we'll have like eight color plates in the middle. And then at some point she changed her mind and, um, learned how to use, uh, uh, what's it called? <laughs> For the design program? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, and she learned to use it really well. It's a beautiful yes. book. <laughs> and yeah, she's an archivist. So she's collecting all these photos as we go along and, um, and did the layout and did a really nice job. Yeah, yeah. As you say, the, the design and the photographs are, are, I think, part of the appeal of the book in addition to all of the the stories and history. So there are a couple of questions um, from audience members about the salmon, different aspects of the relationship between salmon and the peninsula. Um, so first historical question from Wayne, how did the original dam on the Black River affect the salmon? And was there any way for salmon to bypass it? Um, and then a more recent, but also historical question, um, could you talk a little about the salmon hatchery um, and history of that? Um, <clears throat> I don't know much about the salmon hatchery. Are you, you mean the one in Issaquah or what? So the, um, my guess is there was not a way for the salmon to bypass the dam. The dam was only there for three years. Uh, mm -hmm. Far more serious for the salmon was when they made the mountain like cut and the Black River basically dried up. And so um, fish, fishery biologists um, believe that we actually lost um, pink salmon and um, oh, what's one of the other ones? Uh, you know, there's like five kinds of salmon or something that, that we lost two runs that because you, the Black River didn't exist anymore. And so uh, those runs no longer existed. Uh, we still get uh, some Chinook, although as most of you know, they're um, considered um, under extreme threat. And um, we haven't had big success so far in bringing them back. Um, we also get uh, sockeyes. Uh, sockeye um, actually have been known to spawn right on the shores of the peninsula, um, but we don't get a ton of them. And um, uh, and of course, uh, in the park itself, as part of the effort to bring you know restore salmon, there are I think four or five areas that have been um, where the shoreline's been uh, turned into what they hope is good salmon habitat. And, and we know that the Chinook salmon, which mostly breed up and uh, spawn up in the Cedar River and its tributaries, um, that the juveniles come down and they hang out in the Andrews Bay. Um, so, um, uh, uh, but um, yeah, I think how much these salmon habitat restoration sites are helping is not clear yet. Um, it hasn't been long enough and there aren't enough studies either. So, you know, they kind of put them in and hope for the best. And um, so um, there were other, so I mentioned that there was a, I think it was a sockeye, maybe it was a coho run that used to go up uh, Genesee Creek. And we know that from, um, I can't remember if it was T.T. Uh, Waterman or um, there was another anthropologist whose name is escaping me at the moment, Peabody. Um, one of them mentioned that there was a salmon run in that creek, but of course that creek doesn't even exist anymore. Um, you know, there's no creek that runs down Rainier Valley anymore. It's um, presumably there's still water drainage under under Rainier Avenue or something. I'm not quite sure, but um, you know, they, they filled in Wetmore Slough with garbage and then they turned it into a park. And uh, so that run is clearly gone. Mm -hmm. 
So the, we have a question from, from Doug Centauri, um, who says, it sounds like there was limited development on the peninsula, but are there any visible remnants today of 19th century development in Squid Park? Um, on the peninsula, no, there was <clears throat> um, Olmstead and Schwagerl and um, uh, some of the park commissioners, they're all very uniformly uh, agreed that it was a virgin forest. Now, uh, Don Sherwood, who was a parks historian in the 1970s, he recorded a story that there was a Frenchman's estate up near the amphitheater or something in the 1880s. But as far as I can tell, I don't know where he got that story. He did not list his sources. Um, he was kind of a story collector and didn't always check the, the facts. And as far as I can tell, that story is a complete fabrication. So if there were, <laughs> <laughs> if there were a Frenchman with an estate up in the amphitheater area in the 1880s, he would have been squatting on Philip Ritt's land and, um, or, or Bailey's land if it was a little later. But um, so I think that was completely false. There, uh, yeah, there was, there was basically no development at all as far as we're aware until 1913 when the Parks Department moved a couple of cottages into the, uh, where the tennis courts are now. And that is what makes it such a, such a treasure for us. So there's one, um, one question here, and I think it'll be the last question since we're almost at 7.40 PM. Um, look, it's been a wonderful presentation about the history. This is a question that looks toward the future. Um, Alan asks, does Paul have any thoughts about what the future of the peninsula might be? And is it considered to be a pretty healthy forest that is there now? Uh, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, Paul Shannon is our sort of volunteer forest steward that um, has kind of the most informed opinion about this, but uh, there are very serious concerns. So um, you may have heard about the sword fern die off that started in 2013 and um, just like consumed acres of sword ferns and is still going. Um, it's spread, you know, not all the sword ferns are dead, but there's, you know, dying sword ferns like almost everywhere in the park now. Um, so that's one major concern. And um, uh, there are also hemlocks that are dying and <clears throat> that may be from rhizoctonia, which is sort of a natural fungal pathogen. Um, and so Paul's starting an initiative to map out the hemlocks and, and what condition they're in. Uh, one of the bigger threats to the survival of the forest is, of course, uh, people loving it to death. Um, we're constantly uh, fighting social trails that, you know, beat down the understory and, and break up the forest so that, you know, the animals that live there, you know, they don't really want to be where the people are. And so the bigger blocks of, you know, area without trails, um, the better for the survival of the birds and mammals that live there. Um, so off trail use is a, is a significant issue. Um, what do I think its future is? Why? Well, I mean, I think it'll stay a park. I don't think the parks department will back off of that, but um, how healthy the forest will stay. I mean, overall, the forest is fairly healthy. Um, I'm still planning on meeting with a tree pathologist who said, oh, we've got tons of diseases in the forest. But um, <clears throat> but uh, right now I'm doing that as part of the natural cycle. I mean, you know, fungi have their life cycle too. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I think overall the forest is still fairly healthy, but we've got other than, you know, the sword fern die off, which is uh, a very significant non-healthy thing. And then, um, you know, there's, there's a, a fair amount of concern about the park just being loved to death and what we can do about that because the population will only grow. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Well, this is absolutely superb. Wendy, thank you so very much. Paul, thank you so very much. There's so many more questions, but there's an answer, which is <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> So you can oh. find the book online in our store. You can um, put it on, we do curbside sales. Uh, we do that. And I'm sure we're going to have um, Paul's lantern book, Cherry, Cherry Trees and Lanterns. Um, there's another word in there too, but I can't remember what it is. 
<laughs> Gates. Gates. Sorry. <laughs> and so we'll we'll have those available. You can shop for them now and pick them up this weekend. Uh, we'll be closed on Sunday, but you can pick them up any other Saturday or Sunday between nine and three. Um, you can also remember, look for um, Subuxid, I'm sorry, Sewer Park. Stories. Uh, Sewer Park Stories, right. And that's online, sewerparkstories.org. And you'll find not just um, words, but audio, um, you know, presentations about people's um, passion, love and insights in the park. And then in the belly of night, will be coming out later on this year. Um, I'm sure, um, Wendy, I know you have your email is at wendycall.com. Is that also a place where people can find the book too? Yeah, yeah, when, when the book comes out, it has been COVID delayed, but it should be out within a few months. Yeah, that will be at my website. Super, so, um, you know, this is exciting, this is fun. Of course, each time you learn a little bit more, more questions spring up about the history of the amazing sewer park, of course, I learned, I think I know a lot of stuff, but I learned so much more tonight. Um, thank you, Paul, for sharing your passion, your knowledge, and your, your incredibly hard work to put this thing together and make it happen. And all the people who are part of the Friends of uh, Sewer Park who helped put this thing together and supported it from its inception. So um, I'd just like to mention, um, if for some reason getting the book at Audubon isn't convenient for you, you can order it online from uh, the Friends of Seward Park website, uh, www.sewardpark.org. And you go there and you scroll down a bit, you'll see a picture of a book and uh, some words under the book, there will be a little link to click and you can, you can go there to order the books and we'll mail them to you. Now, if you also um, want to sh share the amazing um, experience that you had tonight, it is recorded, it's on uh, Sewer Park Audubon's YouTube page. We'll also have a link to it from our homepage beginning tomorrow morning, but you'll be able to relive this whole experience um, um, and on video and hopefully uh, you'll share it with some people who weren't able to, weren't able to join us tonight. So uh, once again, thank you all for um, you know, sharing your time and your evening with us. I was gonna do something cruel like pull an April Fool's Day trick on you, but I decided not to because you guys, two wonderful people, and I certainly want to make sure you enjoy coming back to us again. Um, so, yeah, everyone in the audience, we appreciate you joining us and, and showing your concern, love, passion, and excitement about Sewer Park. And we will see you again. Wendy, did you have anything to say before we sign off? I just wanted to yeah, encourage people to, to look at this beautiful book and um, love the park, but do not love it to death. Yes, yes. Stay on trails. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening and good night.